Hi, Haley. This is Matt. We're going to go ahead and get started in about five minutes. Okay. How are you doing? Good. How are you? All right. Got it together this morning. So that's always a good thing. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad you had a good trip. So me too. Just kind of, you know how it is. It's always exhausting when you come home. I do. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for being prepared, you know, for sending out the PowerPoint and, um, I know. I feel bad that I got it to everyone this morning. I'm like, usually I move on those things a little bit faster, but I think losing a couple of days to being like, yeah, I get to go bum around Key West kind of, kind of happens. Sure. Well, um, we'll get started here in a few minutes. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and mute myself. Uh, I know there's a lot of others on right now um, <laughs> and then I'll go through the introduction and then Perfect. Um, we'll go from there. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.
All right, Haley, well, my computer is showing 1131, so I'm gonna go ahead and proceed with the introduction. Uh, just give me a few minutes here. So that said, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual training on a more inclusive working world for people with disabilities. My name is Matt Simmet, and I'll be your moderator for this presentation. This training is being held in recognition of National Disability Employment Awareness Month, uh, which we refer to as NDEAM. This is celebrated every year throughout the entire month of October. NDEAM recognizes the contributions of workers with disabilities while providing education about the benefits of both their skills and talents in the workplaces. Ensuring that America's workplaces continue to include and accommodate people with disabilities is an important part of our economic rebound. Now more than ever, flexibility is important for both workers and employers. Those components resonate with this year's theme titled Increasing Access and Opportunity. In observation of this, Governor Noem has proclaimed the month of October as Disability Employment Awareness Month in South Dakota. Now I'd like to recognize and express appreciation to the Brookings committees that helped make this training possible. Members of the planning committee consist of the Brookings NDM Committee, the Division of Rehabilitation Services, Career Advantage, the Business Resource Committee, and the Brookings Chamber of Commerce. With that, I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Haley Moss. She is a South Florida native who was diagnosed with autism at the age three and made international headlines as the first documented openly autistic attorney admitted to the Florida bar. She re received her Juris duty from the University of Miami School of Law in 2018 and graduated from the University of Florida in 2015 with a bachelor's degree in psychology and criminology. She's also an author, an artist, and an autism advocate who writes and speaks publicly about her journey and gives hope for other autistic people and their families and friends. So before I hand it over to Haley, I do have a couple of housekeeping things I'd like to cover. First, today's presentation has the availability of closed captioning. If you would like to use that, please see the chat box for the link to access that feature. Next, we'd love to hear from you during this presentation. If you have a question for our presenter, please use the chat box feature that is located on your control panel below. Also, if you encounter any technical difficulties or would like to send a chat directly to someone, again, please use the chat box. We'll be answering questions at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to your question, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our presenter, Haley, over to you. Thank you so much for the absolutely wonderful introduction. I truly, truly appreciate it. And I'm really honored to get to be here and to share a little bit about NDEAM and also, so today we're going to be talking about how with the working world with people with disabilities that it's also going to include neurodiversity as part of that conversation. So without further ado, that basically is going to get us started. So Kim is very kind and has the slides going for us and I really appreciate that. So. I want to settle this out with kind of a statement to get us started is that the future is people with disabilities, the future is accessible, and the future is neurodiverse. So the most important thing I think as a disabled person and a neurodivergent person that I like to ask is, we're here and ready, are you? That's the real question. So I'd like to start us off with the next slide then. And just as some quick housekeeping, as we know, Matt has given a little bit of overview as well about captioning and whatnot, but on my end to try to be as inclusive as possible, I know that this is Zoom thank, and based on how things are going, I can't see most of your faces, which I think is by design, but if you need to take a break, you don't wanna be here, you have to answer phone calls, stand up, do anything that makes you feel better, then this is a no judgment zone and feel free to do so. Access is something that we create as a team. It's not something that I'm able to grant to you. It's not something that one person in this meeting can grant to you. So access is something we create together and I am not one to help dictate what your access needs are. And again, if you want a copy of anything, images also have alt text and should be accessible on the screen reader. If they are not, please let me know because again, I want to do my part to help create access for all of us because I don't think any presentation should have barriers to access and barriers to access is also something we're going to talk a little bit more about today as well. Let's keep going. So we heard a little bit about how 
ending 2020 is increasing access and opportunity. And we're celebrating 30 years of one of my favorite laws in the entire world, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And just so we can have a little bit of timeline and a really quick history lesson, a fun fact is that the ADA is older than me. So for all of our friends in the business community who are saying that they have not had enough time to implement the ADA or to make sure that things are in compliance, just keep in mind, I am younger than that. And I've had enough time to make it from, you know, being born to actually going through law school and having a career. So that's plenty of time to, you know, get familiar with the ADA, you know what it does. And we have 75 years of NDEAM and having looked into the history a little bit more, NDEAM started purposely with people with physical disabilities. And mostly I believe based on the fact it was in 1945 may or may not have something to do with veterans returning home from World War II. So, it seems to be with the ADA that a lot of folks in the disability community were finally being included after being left behind given what was going on socially and politically. So what seemed to have happened, at least when I think about the whole history of disability employment, is that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and other psychiatric, mental health disabilities, just different conditions kind of get left behind. And that kind of speaks to this hierarchy of disabilities. We kind of see people with physical disabilities differently than people with cognitive differences at the same time, which is why we're really focusing on neurodiversity today as well, is so we make sure that we are helping the people who do seem to be the most marginalized and seem to have the least access to opportunity. So next, then on the next slide, I'm actually gonna be sharing a little bit of information about disability employment and unemployment. So I really like numbers and I really like data. This is no secret about me, I'm autistic. I love just having things that are cold, hard, and there's not much room for black and white, right? So I, every time someone says one in four people have a disability, you're like, okay, wow, that sounds great. That's a lot of people. And just for perspective, that's 61 million Americans. And when I think about 61 million people, that just seems like a lot. And I also think about where I've come from too. So a lot of these other statistics kind of fall into my disability categories as, an autistic person and a woman and also a lawyer. So autistic adults have the lowest employment rate amongst all people with disabilities. So more so than other intellectual disabilities, more so than physical disabilities, mental health disabilities. And it's even worse when it, you talk about college graduates. And this is actually something that's been going on more and more when I see the new studies. There was an interesting study that came from metropolitan areas from the Ruderman Family Foundation that the higher level of education that a person with a disability has, the more likely they are to have struggles finding employment. And if they do, the salary disparities are quite large as well. So the further up in terminal degrees, the salary disparity is ridiculous. I remember seeing what it was. I live in Miami and seeing what it was here just was very disheartening. And it's even more disheartening when you think about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who are often left behind, that they are the least likely to be in paid jobs. So they often are paid less than a minimum wage or they end up in a lot of internships. And I always like to talk about lawyers because everyone always sees lawyers as the change makers, right? Like everyone sees people like me as the ones that create policy, that we end up in politics or the really important court battles, the ones that are also fighting for the implementation and enforcement of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And here we are with 25% of the population having a disability and less than 1% of lawyers will identify as having a disability. And we can get into the semantics of why that might be a whole other day. But again, most of y'all aren't lawyers and it's not as fun to talk about the stigma and all the different barriers to access that attorneys and law students face along the way. That's a whole other can of worms that if anyone wants to talk about another day, I'm happy to open that up and have that conversation with you. And also, I like to think about this at the intersection of multiple marginalizations. So when you start accounting for disability, gender, sex, sexual orientation, race, when you start accounting for other factors, the numbers look a lot different. So as a woman, it's really important to understand that there is a huge disparity in disabled women who are employed. So a lot of non-disabled women overwhelmingly have jobs while women with disabilities, it's a little over a third of us. So I think that's really just something to keep in mind when we think about how this affects people generally. And even when we're thinking about how do we help the most marginalized out of the people with disabilities that we serve. So how we serve folks who are gender minorities, how we serve black, indigenous and people of color with disabilities, just thinking about these things as we go forward as well. 
next slide. So that brings us to our discussion of neurodiversity in helping our most marginalized folks. So neurodiversity is this idea that neurological differences are to be recognized and respected as any other human variation. So people who may be neurodivergent or labels that fall under this idea of neurodiversity include autism, ADHD, learning disabilities, Tourette syndrome, intellectual disabilities, and mental health disabilities. So if this is something that seems new to you, that's okay. And I always like to say this was new to me until I was probably in college. But I, it's not that it was new as a concept that, hey, you know, people who have cognitive differences are not less, they're just different. I knew that since I was nine years old when I first found out I was autistic. I mean, my parents sat me down and compared it to having superpowers like Harry Potter. I thought I was the coolest person on the planet at the time. But what seemed to happen is the first time I heard the word neurodiversity, I was in college and I thought it was really goofy sounding, honestly. I was like, what is this whole idea? What is this thing? And then the more I learned about it and realizing it was part of this greater disability rights movement and that autistic people like me were fighting for inclusion at work and on campus and all that stuff, I was so, so excited. And then I ended up writing about it for my college newspaper, thinking like, why don't we have any affinity groups? Why don't we have any support for students? Why aren't we treated like any other marginalized group on campus? And then I got really excited about it and realized there's so much work to be done. And then when I entered the workforce, I thought about it all over again. And we'll talk about that a little bit more since there's also a lot of different hiring initiatives. There's all sorts of different ways that people are looking to bring neurodiversity into the workforce. And there are good reasons why we are trying to bring neurodiversity into the workforce. Next slide. So here's some of the benefits that kind of have been happening with neurodiversity at work and also greater disability employment. So a lot of major companies are really, really into autism at work and neurodiversity at work more generally. So you see it at a lot of big tech companies and also in engineering and mathematics and finance, you see it across a lot of industries. So most of the big ones, if you're really interested in learning more, you could see kind of what the folks at say, Microsoft, Ernst & Young, Ernst & Young actually had a really interesting segment on 60 Minutes this past Sunday all about neurodiversity and autism hiring. So that was pretty fascinating to watch. And again, I also will have feelings about it because I have feelings about everything as anyone who's ever spoken to me at length about disability knows that I always have an opinion that SAP is also really big. They're a German software company that is very large here. And even just knowing what they've been up to, that they, every time that one of these companies runs a pilot program and hiring neurodiverse people, what seems to happen is that there's a major fix that they're able to somehow innovate, that neurodiversity drives innovation. So they're able to save money, create new customer service feedback loops, all sorts of really interesting things. And SAP in particular had a fix that saved the company nearly $40 million from having a neurodiverse team. And a lot of folks love the favorable public opinion of businesses, the good, the feel good thing. So I have a grocery store down the street from me and y'all in South Dakota, I don't know if you have this, but it's called Publix. And Publix happens to be like the greatest thing in the world to me. And every time I go to Publix, there are always people with disabilities who work there. And most notably, the cashiers have Down syndrome. So whenever I see a cashier with Down syndrome at Publix, I feel really good about shopping there. It's here someone who is in my community who has a job bagging my groceries, ringing me up, always a smile on his face when he sees me. It just is a wonderful feeling. And I feel good about shopping at Publix. But even though I feel good about shopping at Publix, that isn't the end of the story. Publix isn't just hiring folks with Down syndrome to make me feel good. They're not just doing it to also get people out of the house and be able to grant that independence. So whenever I say that people tell me it's the right thing to do, I tell them it's the only thing to do. And that at the same time, neurodiversity and disability hiring improves a company's bottom line. They make more money. That is the nicest way of saying that when companies employ people with disabilities, they have higher revenues than their competitors. They are able to make more money. Their shareholders get better dividends. Everybody is happy all around. It, it basically helps everybody. And of course, when it comes to culture and confidence and all those things, we just benefit from working with people who are different than us. We don't all have the same life experiences. I have no idea what it's like to be neurotypical. I probably never will. Just like I have no idea what it is like to be a dude in this world. I just don't know what it's like to ever be a guy. I probably will never know. But we all have differences and our brains work differently. And that's how we solve problems and create solutions that we didn't even know that we needed. 
Next slide. So with all this in mind, especially when we keep in mind our kind of disparities between hiring and also just our disparities with why are there all these benefits, but there's not this inclusion. I like to think about it as there's three major barriers for neurodiversity and disability more generally as well at work. And those three things are ableism, non-disclosure, and masking. The last two go hand in hand, but I think that we are remiss if we do not have a discussion about disability without talking about ableism. And it's something that we don't usually, I feel, talk enough about. And the more time that I spend navigating the world as a disabled person, I realize that ableism is kind of the biggest thing that's in my way. So oftentimes I get told about all the different barriers that I'm overcoming, is that I've overcome my autism, I've overcome low expectations, I've overcome some terrible tragedy or some horrible thing that absolutely could have ruined my life, but I don't let that happen. And that's not necessarily the case either, which brings us to ableism generally. So the next slide will overcome and what I feel like I did actually overcome. So ableism is actually just a set of prejudices and beliefs against people with disabilities. So it's stereotypes, discrimination, or just treating people differently because of disability and not always in a flattering way. So whenever people ask me what I really overcame, oftentimes the answer is rooted in ableism. I overcame the fact that someone didn't expect anything of me. I overcame that certain environments in education weren't designed with me in mind. I overcame the biases to getting a job that are purposely stacking the odds almost against somebody with a disability. Think about the way that your job descriptions might be written, that there might be a way that you can self get someone with a disability to self-select. When I was looking at lawyer jobs, I was looking at diverse summer associateships my first or second summer of law school. And not one of them said, people with disabilities are encouraged to apply. Or when you were looking at the diversity statements, who was included, it did not consider disability as diversity. Yet because each of these organizations wanted to take data, they were all asking if you had a disability. And of course, when it's not a government contractor or government job where they're required to collect that data and they know that they have to hit certain aspirational goals under section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act, you're like, well, what do I do? And of course your answers are the same three horrible things. Yes, no, or prefer not to disclose. Yes is already subjecting myself to bias. No is a flat out lie. And prefer not to disclose. What do we do with the prefer not to disclose? I see it as, yes, I do have a disability, but I don't wanna tell you about it. So I feel like no matter what I do, I'm already walking into that bias. And I walk into that bias every single time I realize that I am going to constantly be judged against a neurotypical standard, whether or not I request an accommodation, whether or not I say anything. I am very open about who I am. I already know that I have a different way of seeing the world and perceiving what's around me, that I have to be constantly on to be perceived. So ableism for me, is this idea that I have to prove my confidence when you already have the privilege of being presumed confident when you get into the door. That I'm being judged on all these factors that you would never judge somebody on or you would just assume that are already there, such as making eye contact, such as how my hands are moving. But something that you would just write off as nervousness or just being nervous on somebody else, you're gonna say is it's the autism, that she's not capable of something the same way. And something else that's really, really worth bringing up with this idea of ableism is that it can also be internal. It might not just be your stereotypes or beliefs, but it's something that we learn as people with disabilities as well. So when I was in school, there's always different learning styles. And when I was in law school, everything really revolved around this idea of a Socratic method. So if you've ever seen like Legally Blonde when they call on you, and then all of a sudden like, Miss Moss, can you tell us the holding in say Marbury versus Madison and you're saying they're like that's really quick to just be put on the spot and you're just like super nervous and then you you totally get flustered and you don't know the answer and even though you did the work and they're like well you must not have done the reading and then you start feeling really dumb and lazy and stupid and then you start believing you're dumb and lazy and stupid and all of these things about yourself that might not be true but that's because society is telling you that even though it's not that you didn't know the answer you just couldn't get the words out 
that's kind of what it feels like inside. And then you start believing these things about yourself. So when it comes to confronting ableism as a barrier to access and disability inclusion, especially at work, think about your events. So I always tell people, are networking events accessible? What happens if somebody can't cognitively handle it? What happens if somebody, if there's so much pressure to say drink alcohol and you have people who are either in recovery or can't drink for mental health reasons or just don't feel comfortable? How do we do that? And access, again, is something that we create. It's not something that one person can grant. So when we talk about accessibility, that's something to really keep in mind. Which brings us to our second point of what else is about non-disclosure as a barrier, especially at work. So next slide on that one. So non-disclosure is also a barrier. And that's where we get back to this idea of internalized ableism as well. So disclosing you have a disability at work, especially if you are someone with a cognitive difference who might have the ability to come off as neurotypical to the unsuspecting eye. And I know disclosure is highly personal and situational dependent. So I am far more likely to disclose at work than I am in certain personal relationships of mine. Because it's a lot different for me to say, I need something for like an accommodation than it is for me to say, hey, there's this thing about me that is very vulnerable that I want you to know as my friend. So I like to think about that in how we do disclose across contexts and why we disclose. But I also think it's important because everyone goes, of course you're gonna disclose, you need an accommodation. But there's also a lot of reasons why somebody would either try to self-accommodate or just try their best to succeed on their own. So here's some of the th reasons why somebody would not disclose. In, I've asked around in my other friends with disabilities and other autistic people in particular, because I just didn't want to really guess as to why people don't disclose. I'm like, okay, if you've never disclosed before or you just are very, very selective about it, can you tell me why? And here's some of the most common things that came up is that people didn't want to be seen as weak. They really didn't want to be seen as that they were receiving special treatment from a supervisor or that they were a favorite just for getting an accommodation. People felt that they were, weren't good enough, that they would be asking for too much and all that internalized ableism, which is why I picked this graphic here to show like the kind of the thoughts that go through your head, like I'm not good enough, I'm asking for too much, I need to be fixed, I'll never get a job because of that. You also have the pre-existing stereotypes and potential discrimination. And I know having disclosed, you will face some of these and sometimes you have to face it head on within yourself. Sometimes you have to face it head on with somebody else. I know the stereotypes happened all the time. I worked in litigation and I would always get assigned to certain tech jobs because I was seen as a human supercomputer. So sometimes I wonder if I didn't disclose what I've gotten different assignments rather than just like super techie type stuff. But that is something I, is, that is neither here nor there. I don't know what happens in the past. That is exactly what it is. And that brings us to our next point of what else can be a barrier. And that is on the next slide. So this idea of masking. So we try. So for a lot of people with disabilities, it's like this idea of trying to pass as being non-disabled. So I like to talk about this, especially in terms of autism. So it's kind of taking on this like neurotypical persona or trying to hide behavior that's seen as socially unacceptable or performing. And these things prevent people from being their authentic selves and really showing up. And when we're talking about access and inclusion, how are we able to exactly give people access and inclusion if they don't even feel like they could bring them, their selves to be seen and accepted for who they are? And people will hide this behavior for the exact same reasons that we talked about earlier, that they're afraid of being seen as less, they don't wanna be treated differently, et cetera, et cetera. So that in mind, we're gonna keep moving on. So the next slide is a little bit of a thing that when it comes to is being open. So I would, say that I'm openly autistic and that I'm not afraid to hide or mask who I am and I have the freedom to be who I am at work in my personal life in every single way possible and that is a huge privilege and a huge blessing that I do not take for granted that I have a lot of really accepting people around me and y'all seem pretty cool too so y'all are pretty accepting and I'm grateful for that and that's something that I would love to see more of too which which keeps us moving and we're going to keep moving this direction too and that kind of goes into this idea of the law and policy side of things. So on the next slide, we're actually gonna talk more about the ADA. And if you don't know what the ADA is because you've somehow missed that it was ADA 30, or you would like a more plain language explanation that isn't all the legal mumbo jumbo, here is a somewhat more plain language version that I have tried to cook up that explains exactly what the ADA does. So it is 
a federal law that prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities. So you can't exactly be treated differently in jobs, government programs, services and buildings, telecom, all sorts of different things. And essentially, especially when you read different court, court holdings like I do, because I actually read Supreme Court opinions and lower court opinions for fun, that it ultimately turns out that the ADA allows people with disabilities to be part of their communities. So whether that's being not in an institution, whether that's having physical access to a building, whether it's being able to take a standardized test to go to school. So the ADA is super expansive and also covers disability discrimination at work. So lots of really fun stuff to think about. Next slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit about discrimination in employment. So here's kind of the main gist of Title I of the ADA. So you can't really discriminate against somebody if you have more than 15 employees, including state and local governments, and it covers everything all the way from applications, hiring and firing. So the whole employment spectrum. If you are wondering if you are a smaller business than that, check your local and state civil rights laws to see if it might be more restrictive. The ADA is not the ceiling, it is the floor. So this is like the bare minimum. That's what I like to remind people. Some state civil rights laws may cover employers with like five employees. I live in Florida, it's still 15 here, but not everywhere is that way. So before I give super legal advice on this stuff, definitely check your state and local like civil rights stuff to make sure that you are you might be covered under something similar. And if you are not, again, this is the floor. We can all do better to be more inclusive and more accessible to our friends who are job seekers and employees with disabilities. Next slide. And of course, when we're talking about Title I, we are always talking about disclosure on the job and when the right time to disclose necessarily is for somebody. So that's something really, really important for people is they're like, when do I disclose? Do I do it in a cover letter? Do I do it in an interview? Do I do it when I need an accommodation? So there is no necessarily like right time. Again, it's highly personal. And at least for me, I disclose pretty quickly because my resume kind of sucks if I don't say I have a disability. Like I'm gonna be completely honest with y'all. My resume sucks otherwise. All it looks like I've done is one time I worked for a judge and one time I practiced in anti-terrorism litigation and I never wrote anything and I never did anything that I think is interesting except for like that one time I wrote an article about like physical fitness because I thought it was fun but it just doesn't really paint a good picture of me and it doesn't really tell you anything about me as a human being or who I am. And a lot of my work is rooted in disability. Disability has made me a more resilient person. It makes me more self-aware. It makes me more confident. And I don't feel right if somebody does not know this about me. But there are also somewhat more technical answers to the question of when do you disclose, which is on the next slide. So, Basically, you don't have to disclose unless you actually you need an accommodation. So if you like, that's the best time for most people to disclose or that's the general rule is that, and of course, employers have to provide reasonable accommodations to qualified individuals, except when it would cause an undue hardship. That is legal mumbo jumbo. That basically is a nice way to say that they have to give you an accommodation unless it is really expensive or really, really difficult to do. That's kind of the like, I didn't read the law, but that's the simple way of describing this. And of course, accommodation also is something that we're gonna talk about in today's age on the next slide too. So of course, as we know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. It is why I don't get to see all of your smiling faces in person. I really wish I'd got to. I, want, I told Matt many times, I would love nothing more to hang out with you guys. I get to give him a hug and see everyone in person and get to really just engage with everybody. But at the same time, as much as pandemics kind of suck for a variety of reasons and including in the workforce, probably one of the best things that has come out of it is this idea of disability innovation. So of course, remote work and flexible scheduling is one of those accommodations that people like me have asked for plenty of times and it's been seen as unreasonable and an undue hardship. And of course, the minute the entire world shut down, every single company in the history of forever has offered remote work and telecommuting and disabled people everywhere wanted to scream and cry at all at the same time. And it benefits us because there's so many reasons that somebody might need a flexible schedule. It might be having to go to a doctor's appointment or have extra mental health care or be able to be in an environment that's sensory friendly. That I know for me, I've been working from home for a long time at this point 
which is basically a nice way of saying since January because I left my last legal job right before New Year's. I started my own business. I mostly worked from home when I was not traveling to see smiling faces like yours. And it was really great because I was still able to take care of myself, manage how I felt. I got to work in my own space. So I didn't need like an accommodation or be like, oh my God, there are fluorescent lights here. They're the absolute worst. So people with disabilities want remote work as an option, even when one day we get to go back to normal, whatever normal necessarily is, because it's able to give us the freedom and flexibility to be able to accommodate our disabled bodies and minds that we aren't trying to just bend ourselves to fit this mold of normal necessarily. Just something to keep in mind in the future. Next slide. So going on to this idea of undue hardship is here's a little bit of fun knowledge about accommodations that they generally are pretty cheap. They cost on average at one time cost of less than 500 bucks. And obviously your dividends from hiring someone with a disability are pretty big compared to $500 definitely looks good. And in the neurodiversity space, it looks a lot more obvious in accommodations that I needed, especially didn't cost anything. So I'm someone who always liked having headphones in because it helps me tune out the noise around me. I struggle a lot when people are talking. I struggle a lot with having that kind of extra input. I'm very easily distracted. It's kind of weird sometimes working from home, especially when there's more than one person in your house working from home. So that's kind of one of those things. Normally I'd have to ask an employer like, hey, I want to use headphones while I'm working. And now I don't have to do that. So that's also really nice about remote work. And I mentioned earlier that I really, really hate fluorescent lights. They're bright and they give me migraines. Two very, oh, and they hum. Good, good luck now. So now every time you see fluorescent lights, you're going to be thinking Haley said that they hum and you're going to be mad at me. And I'm really sorry for that. So if I ask my former boss at the law firm, like, hey, we have fluorescent lights in the office and they're the absolute worst. Can you replace them as an accommodation? That would probably be unreasonable, but they can always move me to a different room that might not have had fluorescent or somehow have them on a dimmer or let me bring in a different or get me a different lamp or something to have a different source of light. So it's how do we kind of bridge this gap as well? And for all the folks out there that go, that's great. I want to do this. How do I get an accommodation? Is you can ask, you can put it in writing, or you can just have an honest collaboration and conversation. So this kind of circles back a little bit to disclosure and something that HR folks and other people with disabilities have recommended to me and it's something I've been doing a lot more in my life is you start that conversation from a position of power. And the best way to do that is just saying, I work best when X, Y, and Z. So it's kind of a way that puts the onus on the employer but also empowers the employee. Sometimes if you don't feel like disclosing, that might be a good way to open that conversation on being productive. So I'm someone who does not do well with really ambiguous instructions. If you've ever worked with me, you know, I'm like, I like hard deadlines. I like knowing what's going on. I'm very, very on the ball if I know what there is to be on the ball about. So the way I've had that conversation when my boss just says, go do this thing, I would just go, I work best when you give me clear instructions. And that was kind of the cue of like, as a combination, you should write everything out for me. Or you should just be sure that you're really, really thorough in explaining things. So I just go, I work best when you give me clear instructions. And that changed how we had that conversation going forward. Next slide. So people with disabilities are super resilient and super fun. And a lot of us are also small business owners or work for ourselves or in the gig economy because it does have that flexible scheduling. So I always talk about it as a recent, relatively speaking, small business owner, like what happens if you don't work for somebody else anymore? How do you accommodate yourself? How do you stay accountable? And how do you also tell the people that you work with that you might be struggling or you might need something such as extra time without exactly upsetting anyone? So that's something that I like to think about. And I'm sure some of you have better answers to this than I do. But I've learned that you have to also be really good at being able to grant what, you're, what you need and take care of your own access needs while also being accountable to those around you who are still depending on you and also being accountable to yourself and not necessarily just using this idea of I need an accommodation as a way not to do what you have to do because you're still answering to yourself. So just kind of a little bit of something to think about at this point. And once we clear up some of these barriers to access on the next slide, such as basically this idea of disclosure and accommodation, we have a lot of stereotypes to be broken, especially when we're trying to get rid of ableism, we're trying to make people disclose and make people feel that they could actually like, you know, 
bring them full, their full selves to work and that they're going to be supported in the workforce. So here's some of the things that I would really like to see go away in the near future. We love to talk about mental health. Lawyers love to talk about mental health. Everybody loves to talk about mental health and self-care. And I think we're not exactly the best at supporting people who do have mental health difficulties and disabilities. And that might be exacerbated in these times when we are still craving connection with one another. We still want to be together in person. We still want to see our friends. We want to hug our loved ones one more time. I know for me, it's definitely been hard. I lived at home for literally seven months. I have moved back out of my parents' house because I went back in March. I moved out maybe two weeks ago. And now I'm back at my place and obviously life has changed. And just having that change of scenery has been really good for me. And I felt like at the same time while I was at home, like I felt very anxious. I felt very kind of on edge because I felt myself regressing. And I think that mental health thing, I, I wish that if I was still like working with other people that people think to check in. How do we make sure that we know that not every day is going to be great? So there's kind of this weird feeling about mental health stigma that one day you hit rock bottom, then you get help, and then everything is going to be fine forever. And that's not really how it works. So how do we make sure that we're able to take care of each other and hold each other accountable and also just be able to support each other on those days in between where things might not be so hot? Just something to think about going forward. I also really am not the biggest fan, and I mentioned this a little, started to touch on this with the autism at work programs and neurodiversity at work programs, is this idea of the STEM genius stereotype. So a lot of us get boxed into or try to get recruited for tech jobs. I still try to get recruited for tech jobs and I'm not even a tech person at all. There's, I have never taken a computer science class. I don't know how to code. I don't know how to do any of these like super, super technical things. I wish I did, but I am not a tech genius. And still by virtue of being autistic, people think that I am a computer genius. And the other really big stereotype that seems to happen is that by virtue of disability being such a huge part of identity for me and a bunch of others that I've worked with, that people think that all we can do or all we're capable of is working in disability services, nonprofits, or even that kind of area of law. So everybody just assumes that I will take on your discrimination case or represent your child in an IEP hearing. And I have no experience whatsoever with the special education system. I do not know how to represent someone in that. And I also just never was really interested in that. My first job in litigation outside of school was representing victims of terrorism. That is a very nice way to say that I helped recover money against drug cartels. That is kind of not the same thing as representing a child in an IEP hearing. So yes, we have other interests and things about us as people other than our disabilities. And sometimes that really shocks a lot of people who get to know me and they actually find out that I have interests and different hobbies and things that aren't just talking about disability and neurodiversity as much as I love it. And I do work in the field of disability, but I promise I'm a person outside of this at the same time. Kind of just something to think about with those stereotypes going down. Next slide. So if we're breaking stereotypes, we have to think about what our future is going to look like. And here's some of the stuff that I really, really want to see when I grow up. And I'm hopeful that with ADA 30, we've made a lot of progress since 75 years ago with the start of ending, at least we've thought to move past just our friends with physical disabilities. So here's what I'd like to see in the next 30 years or 75 years, or hopefully as long as I'm on this planet, because if this all gets done, I might not have to do all this stuff or not have to talk about it someday. That's kind of the dream, I think, for anybody who works in certain disability services is that one day this work won't be necessary. It's not that we don't love it, but it shouldn't be our job to be screaming about it all the time. So I want to see a world, world where we have neurodiverse leaders. We have more collaboration between employers and em employees and prospective hires, more inclusive work cultures, support for our friends who also have mental health disabilities and actually aligning people to their strengths all across the spectrum. So not just in STEM and not just pigeonholing people based on what we think that they would be good at or their interests based on what we perceive as a stereotype. Next slide. So I think a lot about what being inclusive of neurodiversity looks like. And what I've noticed is it really starts from the top down with being open and vulnerable. So when you're disclosing a disability or you're talking about disability, for a lot of people, it is our most vulnerable quality. 
I've noticed this a lot more in my personal life than my professional life is it's very different for me to have those vulnerable conversations because you feel like you're at a disadvantage, especially when you're talking to somebody who's not disabled. I went, I go through this with friends more often than not. Is it's very like, here's the thing that is sometimes very difficult for me and you may or may not be able to relate to. And I have to have this conversation with you and at times expect nothing in return and pray you don't say something completely out of line or stereotype or say, you know, I would never know if you didn't tell me, which basically kind of erases my experience. So what seems to happen and what I notice the best of being inclusive is when someone else opens that conversation, sharing something vulnerable about themselves. Maybe they've struggled with their own mental health. Maybe a family member had. Maybe there's another form of diversity that was something that they've had to work through and were able to share something about. And sharing that vulnerability is a way to create that empathetic, inclusive culture at work. And of course, we need to align people to their strengths, have that open and meaningful communication. And something that I always think is really cool, especially in the workplace, and something that I've been thinking a lot about is this idea of universal design. You mostly hear about this when it comes to the classroom in ways that we can accommodate all learners, and that's really wonderful. But this is something that we could take better. And how many of you probably with disability rights are familiar with this idea of the curb cut effect? So it's this idea that we had these curb cuts on sidewalks, and originally they were basically for wheelchairs, but it turns out that they're also really great for people with, who are carrying like baby strollers, and it's just easier for people to navigate. And the other place we see this is closed captions on TV. So I am someone who really likes to watch Netflix with subtitles, mostly because I'm afraid that I'm gonna miss one thing somebody says, and my attention span isn't always 100% there, and it also makes it less work for me to watch a movie. But as we know, closed captioning and subtitles began as a way to help the deaf community. It also turns out that it helps people like me who need help with like auditory processing at times. It also helps people who are learning English or a second language and things like that. So that's what universal design does. It benefits so many different people. And how can we make sure that our environments are designed in a way that everybody can benefit, that it's intuitive and that it is able to be understood and accessed by anybody who wants that. And finally, the, probably one of the best things that we could do to be having neurodiverse leadership and mentorship is that actually care about careers. So a lot of people think that with us that they're doing the right thing just by giving us a job. And I think about this, especially when I think back at my grocery store, those baggers and stuff with Down syndrome have been there for five years. I've lived here for five years. And I'm like, is he ever gonna get promoted? He's really great. And I'm worried that they're not going to get to move up the ladder, that we're not gonna see this advancement in mentorship. And people don't always want to mentor us. And I've noticed this in my professional life because they either think you either have it all, you know what you're doing, or that they don't know how to, or they're afraid. This fear of the unknown hold, ends up holding everybody back. And I also think when we have these discussions about neurodiversity, when we have these discussions about disability, we need to make sure that we're engaging our community stakeholders. So this goes back to this idea of nothing about us without us. And that's why I'm also really glad to be here today. Other than just getting to sometimes talk about myself and my own life experience, having people with disabilities actually leading the conversation about trainings and event planning and recruitment and actually having that firsthand experience along with that professional expertise is really powerful. I feel like when we talk about neurodiversity and we don't have neurodivergent stakeholders leading those conversations and at the table, we're doing something wrong and we see it more often than not. And it's something that I always think about with disability storytelling more generally is that you notice when you watch some of these like news stories, I do this all the time. And I ask myself, who's the audience? Who's the story about? And who's missing from the story? And like every time I see one of those heartwarming disability stories on Facebook, it's usually the person with a disability who's missing from the story. So they literally will interview like their parents, their friends, the person who did a good deed and like the dog on the street. And they won't interview with a person with a disability and ask how they feel. So actually having us as stakeholders and inviting us to that, not just inviting us to that conversation, but making sure we have a prominent seat at it is probably one of the most powerful things you can do. And that's honestly something I'm grateful for. And I hope that we continue those conversations with not just me, because I'm just one person. I'm one voice. And that also keeps going backward. That keeps going forwards, actually, with the next slide as well, is this idea of what neurodiverse leadership necessarily is. And again, we want careers. 
I still would like a pretty cool career. I think it's really great getting to be on my own, but I also think maybe one day I'll get to go back to practicing law or I would also love to get to teach someday. There's just so many things that I would like to do, but I don't wanna just be doing like the odd thing here and there. I really would like a career just like everybody else. And that's what we all want. We all want the same things in life. We want to feel successful. We want stability. We want independence, whatever it may be. And again, to provide those opportunities to allow for growth and preventing stigma from being the setback is people just think that we don't want it and we're not as deserving. I also think it's really important that we're part of those executive teams going forward. The day that I get interviewed at a firm by a neurodivergent partner or a CEO or a managing person, I think that would be such a powerful experience. And that's something that one of my friends who is a recruiter and does neurodiversity outreach for a tech firm, she tells me one of the most powerful things that she has is interviewing other neurodivergent candidates who purposely walk in through a neurodiverse hiring program. And she's like, they feel so at ease. It's a much different experience. And that makes me think, what if we have this model across anywhere that isn't just somewhere that is majority neurodivergent, that if we had this anywhere, or if we had these voices at our tables when we're talking about VR, when we're talking about HR, when we're talking about the business community, can you just imagine what it would be like if we genuinely embraced having different kinds of perspectives and minds at that table? I think it would be a lot more equitable. I think it would be a lot more inclusive. And I think we would have more innovation and more moving in the right direction. It's something that I wanna see and I realize that I have to push a lot for just to even have that conversation. Legal is a slow adopter, unfortunately. I spend a lot of time talking about it. I criticize them regularly and it makes me really excited when we do one thing that seems to move us forward. So I'm really excited to keep moving that forward. And I'd like to continue this conversation on the next slide with our culture of acceptance and inclusion. So we have this idea of being vulnerable with each other and even creating space to have that vulnerability. So I've never worked for a big company before. I've worked for the biggest place I've worked at had 20 people, which is big enough under the ADA for non-discrimination, but not big enough that like you have affinity groups. And I think affinity groups are the most interesting thing on the planet. So if any of you have ever worked somewhere bigger and would like to tell me about it, please do. But this idea that there's peer support and I think peer support for a disability, I've seen it in a couple like major law firms. And I'm like, oh my God, there's like groups that talk about this stuff or mental health and just having that peer support not only just having it exist signals that you care about disability inclusion, but also just gives people a place to feel that they could be themselves or talk to others who have similar experiences, whether it's with their own families or their friends, that generally this is what seems to happen. We didn't even have this when I was in law school and most law schools I know are starting to at least have disability affinity groups. And one of my dear friends heads up the National Disabled Law Students Association, for instance, and he helps create advocacy coalitions and groups that are able to support each other. And I'm like, wow, if we had this, if I had this three, four years ago, my experience would have been so different knowing what opportunities existed and that I wasn't exactly going through this by myself. And that also goes down to better communication, letting people know what exists out there, actually shifting these trainings away. And I've noticed what also seems to happen is when it comes to people with disabilities, everything seems to fall on the person with a disability to make everybody comfortable. And also just like, whenever I got somewhere, I'd be told here are the rules of like socializing properly, like make eye contact, do this, do that. Is imagine if we shifted it from just telling somebody who is new with a disability as a job coach or VR or anything of just, you must do this prescribed list to also making sure that it was inclusive of the entire organization that people knew, hey, this is how we should all be more inclusive. We should be more mindful of these things. And we had people with those disabilities and neurodivergent people leading those conversations. I just can't imagine a world where that happens. And it would make me so happy to see that flipping the script because they're, we're always told to meet halfway, but I don't know what halfway really is because sometimes I feel like I have to make all the effort to make other people feel comfortable. And then that little bit of effort that somebody else has to make, they feel it's too much. It makes them uncomfortable. And then halfway somehow becomes way more than half the effort. And then it's just, you like get left burned out and you wonder what's the point of it all. So having that somewhere in the middle, whatever the middle might be, includes 
having leadership that is disabled and neurodivergent leading the conversation. And that's something that I would really like to see more of. Next slide. H Haley, so, yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, just in terms of a good moderator, we've got about 10 minutes left, uh, maybe about five if we want five minutes for questions. So just giving you a- Don't worry, yeah. perfect. Thank you. This is actually my last slide before the like general contact information. So we're in perfect shape. Sure, wonderful, thank you. I've been trying to be mindful of time as well. So something else that I wanna end our kind of discussion on is focusing on strengths. We talked a lot about this and I think we often focus on the negatives of disability because we see disability as this big green monster to be feared. And here's some of the strengths that the folks at the University of Leeds and Autism Speaks put together with autism and neurodivergence in particular. So like attention to detail, focus, different like observational skills and memory and visual and how much we know about everything. I mean, when it comes to disability, just ask anyone who I know in my personal life and they'll joke that I'm walking encyclopedia. I mean, it's pretty funny that you can ask me some random question on history or you can ask me something about policy and I probably will have some kind of answer even if it is somewhat half-baked because I don't always know every ins and outs. I don't know my healthcare policy that well, unfortunately at this point. I need to learn more about SSDI, but I digress. And then there's just all these different creative things and resilience and just being accepting of others who are different. So I love to show this because it just shows the diversity of what things that we often view as deficit and viewing them through this other lens instead. So I really want to keep this conversation going. And like Matt said, we have about five to 10 minutes or so to save for that. So the next slide is just how to get in contact with me if we run out of time. So that's how you can follow me, send me emails, say hello. And I would love to get to open this floor and conversation further because I think it really is worth having. And I love knowing that there are people who are invested in having an equitable and accessible workforce for people with disabilities, and especially in a way that benefits neurodivergent people who are often at the largest disadvantage. So thank you for indulging me and some of my musings on neurodiversity. I also am happy to talk about personal experience. If you feel shy about using the chat box or speaking up, that's totally okay. You can get in contact with me in the way that makes you feel most comfortable. Again, access is something we create together, so you do you, and I am grateful for your time. Thank you, Haley. I really appreciate what you had to say. Some really spectacular information there. Uh, very well presented. So thank you. So again, um, we do have some time for some questions. So if anybody's got anything, uh, please feel free to use that chat box. And as they come in, I'll just convey them. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sylvia. Um, I just want to take some time here to thank Haley for her presentation um, and also to direct you to the chat box and let you know that there is a brief survey for today's um, presentation. If you have just a couple minutes, we'd love for you to give us some feedback as to how everything went. Um, and then also if you have any feedback for, uh, for Haley on her great presentation today. Thank you. Always looking to keep growing as well. So if there's anything that I, it seems like I might have missed or something that you want me to consider in the future, I'm always very excited to keep this going and try to be more inclusive and try to kind of cover more bases. Like I love to learn too, and I'm glad that it's something that we can do together. We got some really great comments coming in. Um, Laura mentioned, and I'm sure you can see this, Haley, but, uh, you know, thank you, Haley. I appreciate you sharing yourself and the information. And I love the you do you statement. <laughs> so. I'm a big fan of you do you. I feel like that oftentimes we're just told to do things by, very by the book and told to like prescribe to this very neurotypical, non-disabled way of existing. And it's like, it's not going to go very well. So you do you like, you know what? I'm, I'm cool with kind of like I guess letting my freak flag fly in some way. I'm like, you know what? This is just how it is. You do you. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Hey, you saw it last time we had a planning call and I pointed out like all your like cool like figurines and stuff. I was like, <laughs> yeah, like my, like, like my freak flag was definitely flying. Like I know we have to talk about like a real thing, but also I really want to know all about the Darth Vader that I see on the shelf. 
<laughs> uh, I will absolutely pass that on. <laughs> or the information, <laughs> I'll tell you all about it. So. Well, it's about five two. I guess I'm not seeing any any additional questions. In, and we'll give it another minute or two here, and then uh, in an effort to be a good steward of your time, Haley, we'll just uh, wrap mm -hmm. it up. So I'm happy to hang out if anyone has any questions or anything too. And hey, I mean, I, and when it comes to questions, I've definitely gotten the gamut too. So don't be shy if you want to ask me something about personal life experience and if it somehow violates a personal boundary of mine, I'm very happy to gently let you know and point you in the right direction to someone who either knows more or let you know why I don't feel cool with it. But most things and most questions are pretty fair game to me. Haley, this is Sylvia and I'm going to break the rules a little bit and not my, write my question in the chat box. I'm just gonna ask you outright, but- um, Go for it. I was just curious if you had any um, accommodations when you were going to school and in law school that really helped you succeed. Uh, did you feel like you needed any? Um, and if, if you could give us some insight on that, I'd appreciate it. So when I was younger in school, mostly the stuff that we do is I used to go with my parents to those meetings at the beginning of the year with the teacher. So I went to private school. So I guess I had a 504 plan. But like what we would do is we would talk about our goals at the beginning of every school year. And each year, what I, what I learned, and this is why when we talk, when I talk to like educators, I would say, please encourage kids to go to IEP meetings in 504, no matter how on in parents, but like no matter how unpopular you think that is, because they probably have different goals than you have for them. So my goals growing up were always like, help me make friends with girls, because I was not friends with any girls. And of course, my parents were like, obviously, like, give her more challenging schoolwork, or my teachers would be like, she's really gifted in school, let's give her more challenging work. And I'd be like, I just want to make a friend. So definitely kind of a different way of seeing things there. When I got to law school, some of the accommodations that I really wanted, I, I really wanted to be able to live closer to campus because driving is something I'm very fearful of. And they didn't have on-campus housing for grad students. So they weren't very helpful there. The problem that I noticed in education, especially when it comes to accommodations, is there, there seems to be this weird myth that extra time is the end all be all and the only thing that they're willing to offer you. And also there's so many barriers in education to getting accommodations that I've noticed. So it's really not that helpful. Like my law school wanted an updated psychoeducational evaluation that basically would have told them the same things that we've known about me since I was three and five and 17 and like all throughout. And it just seemed very unreasonable to me as well to pursue that further because it was very expensive. It's not gonna tell you anything new. It was just all these hoops. And I think that's a huge barrier to access as well when we think about even money in that process. Just something to kind of keep in mind as well. So I've, I noticed I did a lot of self-accommodating with even just how I processed information and how I would study. So a lot of it fell on me. And that's also where it circled back to that internalized ableism because I wasn't doing the same study methods my peers were doing or even paying attention in class the same way that they were because I would use other different aids and other things to help me based on my own self-accommodation. I was just convinced that I was lazy and not doing the work when really that was the only way the work made any sense to me. So accommodation at work I also would usually ask for clear instructions. I remember the first time I was asked to write like a motion to dismiss, I had no clue what was going on. And I stared at the wall for four hours and then went to my boss and said, hey, I don't get this. Can we break this up into smaller assignments? So that way I'd understand and be able to do it and at least not feel too overwhelmed. So I don't think I've had anything necessarily super formal. I just tried to self-accommodate a lot and also try to have those softer disclosure and more collaborative conversations because at least in a lot of my life, just having those deeper conversations about my disability has always been a very need to know basis. So having that, hey, this is what I need. This is what I want. Because something I think I've learned and a lot of people with more invisible disabilities have learned is you disclose and everything is fine and people are okay with it until it affects them. So it's figuring out how to also make it palatable, how to have that conversation and how to be vulnerable at the same time. So kind of a very long-winded and nuanced answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you so much, Haley. I think that really provides a lot of insight into, you know, some of the individuals that we work with and how we can continue to better support them. And just to hear your experiences was was really enlightening. So thank you. That was thank you. Thank you. I, I really like the way you explain that because uh, I have a son that's um, on the spectrum, mm -hmm. and he always tells me 
how am I going to function? You know, and your explanation really helped me as a parent to be able to talk mm -hmm. to him. So that's great. Thank you. You're so welcome. I think, I think it's interesting because even like throughout the life, like throughout my life, the way that being on the spectrum affects me has definitely been different. Like the stuff that I struggled with as a younger kid and stuff I struggled with as, as a teen and just like adulting stuff is just so different. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Well, we've got time for just, uh, actually, I think we might maybe one more question if anybody has one. Okay, well, that said, you know, Haley, on behalf of everybody, I'd just like to send our warm appreciation. Thank you for taking the time and for just delivering a very, very uh, well stated and put together presentation today was just some fantastic information. So I really appreciate it. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody else who signed on today and took part in this. So with that, you guys have a fantastic Wednesday. <laughs>